Good evening and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. After years of losing statewide races, the California Republican Party is trying a new approach to woo voters. But that approach runs counter to the message top GOP presidential candidates are sending. Here's California politics and government editor John Myers. There may be no Republican candidate who's following and fighting against the flow of national political news these days more than Rocky Chavez. I'm running for U.S. Senate. Chavez is a state assemblyman from Oceanside and a candidate for the U.S. Senate seat being vacated by Barbara Boxer. The former Marine Corps colonel is blunt. The California Republican Party has a problem. I think people who have been running in the state have been on a very uh, small message, and almost a, um, an angry message. And a message that California voters have largely rejected. Arnold Schwarzenegger was one of the only Republicans to avoid that fight. His 2006 reelection was the last time the GOP won a statewide race. Over the past two decades, no issue has played a larger role in the party's struggles than illegal immigration. I'm suing to force the federal government to control the border. And I'm working to deny state services to illegal immigrants. Those problems began in 1994, when Republican Governor Pete Wilson led the fight for Proposition 187, a ballot initiative banning government services for illegal immigrants. The federal government won't stop them at the border, yet requires us to pay billions to take care of them. That battle has damaged the GOP's reputation with California Latinos, now 15 million people, some 40 percent of the state's population. Challenges for the California Republican Party really are ones of numbers. They are right now only about 20 percent of the overall California electorate. We're beyond the worry stage as a party in California. We're going to have to redefine ourselves. Mike Madrid is a Latino Republican <laughs> campaign strategist who has been charting both the party's decline and the changes in California. We're becoming a younger, poorer, browner, you know, Latino state and nation. Young, poor, and brown are three characteristics that have, Republicans have never done well with. Which is why Madrid says the presidential campaign threatens to push more voters towards voting for Democrats, not just now, but for years to come. I will build a great, great wall on our southern border, and I will have Mexico pay for that wall. Donald Trump's endorsement of mass deportations may be the reason Republican presidential candidates spent the entire summer talking tough on illegal immigration. Some California Republican leaders say Trump's rhetoric in particular is politically toxic. I've been in politics a long time, and one of the things I've learned is in politics, friends come and go, but enemies accumulate, and he's accumulating enemies. Enemies that could further shrink the power of the California Republican Party, which is why last weekend's convention saw the emergence of a different agenda. First, the state party rewrote its platform on illegal immigration. Long-standing references to illegal aliens and to cutting government benefits for undocumented immigrants, well, those were taken out. Added into the platform, the idea that California Republicans have, quote, diverse views on illegal immigration. Others in the party simply want to change the subject. The one presidential candidate who showed Thank up at the state much. convention Thank says you. Republicans are missing opportunities to talk to voters about a lot of issues. Um, it's frustrating, quite frankly, to be a candidate for president. You're out there talking about issues that I think matter to every American, uh, like where are the jobs. And he's not the only one. But now looking forward, I, I want to care about jobs and the economy. And those are the issues that I think is most important to myself and to the rest, I think, of this country. I think Republicans have to be better at getting their message out and, and making it more personal, telling stories, not just being logical and rational. Strategist Mike Madrid says when California Republicans focus on what have become almost unwinnable statewide campaigns, they lose. When they focus on local races, races that are mostly nonpartisan, they can win. When you don't have a Republican or a Democrat in front of the name and you take out the social issues and the brand, Republicans win on core issues of things like government accountability, government transparency, law enforcement. The bread and butter issues that unite the party are still winning issues even in the deepest blue state of California. You're going to be able to support me? Yeah, 
That strategy, though, won't help the party's candidates for U.S. Senate in 2016. At least four potential candidates for that race were working the hallways and podiums of the state convention. Their fate largely rests on the overall perception of what it means to be a Republican. For KQED Newsroom, I'm John Myers. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi is visiting Silicon Valley this weekend. The Bay Area is home to one of the largest Indian American populations in the United States. During his visit, Modi will meet with tech executives and attend a packed reception at the SAP Center in San Jose. But while he's treated like a rock star in some corners, Modi also attracts critics who question his agenda. Joining me now to discuss this visit are Thomas Blom Hansen, director of Stanford Center for South Asia. Sunita Sarabji is a reporter for India West, a weekly newspaper. And M.R. Rankaswamy, a software executive and founder of Indiaspora, a nonprofit working to improve U.S. Indian relations. Welcome to you all. M.R., I'd like to begin with you. Um, your group, Indiaspora, is one of several hundred helping to organize uh, the event at the SAP Center. Tell us why this visit is so important to members of your group. Yeah. Uh, first of all, just a quick backdrop, and uh, thanks for having us here. Uh, we are now 3 million strong in the United States. So we're 1% of the population, and the community is growing and maturing. And during this time frame, we've not really had uh, an opportunity to feel very proud of our country, uh, I think, for the past uh, decade or so. I think when uh, Prime Minister Modi got elected, he brought the sense of excitement and pride in our community, and that's what you see reflected here as he's coming. Uh, the excitement is palpable. And uh, Sunita, quite a few Indian Americans here participated in Modi's uh, election campaign. Uh, that, that takes an incredible level of commitment. Why do you, th what is it about Modi that has people so excited? I think his agenda is very ambitious. The sense of innovation um, that is so crucial to the Valley here excited many people. Uh, many went back to India to work on his campaign. About 5,000 people from uh, California went back to India to work on his campaign. And what is he hoping to accomplish on this visit to the Bay Area? I think he's hoping to look at tech companies here and what they can bring back to, what he can bring back to India in terms of innovation and how India and uh, the U.S. can collaborate on his ambitious agenda. Uh, including something called the uh, uh, Digital India Initiative. Tell us about that. Um, I yeah, uh, I think uh, this is a very bold initiative in India to transform the country. I think it could be his signature uh, item, if you will, because India has eight, uh, 900 million cell phones, uh, and, but it doesn't have connectivity. And 250 million of those cell phones are going to be smartphones. So looking ahead, if you can lay a fiber network across India to the villages and the cities and the towns, then I think it will unleash you know, a whole bunch of entrepreneurship and innovation and disruption across the country. It will also bring e-governance and transparency. So it's a very, very bold initiative. Much like 20 years ago, India decided to open up the market for cell phones, which made India leapfrog from landlines to cell phones. Come well, on. it's certainly ambitious, but it's also attracting some criticism, some concerns. And uh, Professor Hansen, I wanted to bring you in at this point. You're one of more than 130 academics from around the country who signed an open letter uh, criticizing and raising um, concerns about the Digital India Initiative. What are your worries? So there are three things, I think, that animate that uh, letter. One is that we, um, uh, like many other people also in India, are worried about the fact that there is no proper legal framework for protection of privacy and handling of, of large data uh, sets and uh, large uh, masses of data that will be generated. I should say that I think most of us completely share the, uh, the, the excitement about this, the potential of this project, and it comes in the, in the wake of um, another very ambitious project, which is to have biometric identification of millions of millions of Indian citizens and so on. So it's not that we do not support the Digital India. We are worried about the lack of, of protection of privacy. The second thing we are worried about is that we find that this government um, has so far not had a fantastic, uh, very good record on, uh, on uh, handling uh, and respecting the sort of uh, playbook of, of, of democracy, partly because it comes out, Mr. Modi, and his party, the BJP, comes out of a, 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 a movement, a Hindu nationalist movement, 
that uh, has, as, at its core is a, is a non-democratic uh, movement that is not adhering to or uh, uh, celebrating the principles of liberal democracy that India is so proud of, rightly, and the only major democracy in the world that has a long history outside the West. So well, our, our worry Modi is, is that he was denied a visa. He by was the for United nine States, years, and that's, uh, yes. that's correct. He was, and there are good reasons for that because at the time uh, there were uh, all kinds of questions about his role in the major pogrom that happened in 2002 in Gujarat, where he was the chief minister. Uh, the, there are still some cases working their way through the courts. Uh, and the question of his complicity in this or not is still, the jury is still out on that. And, and this was a case where there was religious rioting, more than yes. a thousand Muslims yes. were killed, yes. and there are questions yes. uh, about why he did not seem to intervene to stop it. Correct. And also in the, in the, in the legal aftermath of the riots, uh, 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 dozens of people have been convicted. They are all associated with his political movement. Many of them are members of the BJP. So the question of him having no knowledge or no complicity, no involvement, is, is something that people are still debating. And I, for one, do not think that that is a, a, a thing that's the last word is not being said in that case yet. Ha hang so. on a second, OK? I, he has never been convicted. So, and India is a democracy. So I don't think you cannot issue someone a visa when he's not even convicted. I, I take uh, offense to that. Uh, and I don't think that's really the case. I mean, you have to wait. There's due process. He's, all, he's been vindicated so far. So there's no reason. And, and it's in the past. I mean, now it's in the future. We are now here today. And I think uh, Modi has forgiven the whole incident on his side. He could have taken a front and said, I'm not going to visit the United States. The first thing he did was he got a call from President Obama, and he returned it, and he tweeted about it. He's become great friends with the U.S. So I think we got to look at the present and stop looking at the past. Sunita, how is this playing out in the community? I know that some Sikh groups, uh, you, you are saying that mm -hmm. we need to move forward, but there are some Sikh groups who are still very upset. They have uh, threatened to uh, protest while he's here. And also, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook has invited him to come speak, mm -hmm. and I was just going through the responses on Facebook about that. Many, many people upset that he's coming and are still upset about what happened in Gujarat. Absolutely. So there are a number of groups that are planning to come out and protest at the SAP Center and also at Facebook when he's there. Um, there is an organization that um, hopes that Mr. Modi will address lesbian, gay, bisexual issues in the country. The Supreme Court uh, last year struck down a, um, a, a rule that would have uh, recriminalized homosexuality. Um, and uh, so, once again, homosexuality is a criminal act. Um, it, it, there are groups that are hoping that uh, Mr. Modi will address that question while he's here. Also, um, the issue of Sikhs. There is a group of Sikhs who have actually put out a $10,000 bounty, if you will, to the first person that will ask him about um, addressing uh, the civil rights of, of Sikhs in India. Uh, Thomas, what, to what extent are these concerns, the privacy concerns you raise, the Hindu nationalism uh, agenda, uh, to what extent are these concerns an issue for the U.S. government in its dealings with India? Well, I think it should be for the U.S. government, but it's just, there certainly should be a concern for the companies that are uh, hoping to operate, and I think, I hope will operate in India on a large scale, that if you want to do that and, and have a credible operation, uh, one should also make sure that one uh, operates in an environment that has some protection, both of the companies as well as the individuals. And India is famous for its uh, capacity to uh, generate pro protest about virtually anything. And I think if I was uh, a tech company planning to go to India, I would make sure that I wouldn't get uh, uh, create a whole lot of trouble because I didn't do my homework. So what we are saying is basically in the absence of this kind of legal protection, you have to then look at which is the government and what are the people in power who will then be the, the guarantors of this being done in a way that is in keeping with India's democratic tradition. That is our question. Is this government actually willing and able to do that? We are not sure. We want to have the conversation. That's why we wrote the letter. Yeah, I, I, I take a different perspective to you on this. Uh, we are entrepreneurs here in Silicon Valley. We invest in countries. And it would be hard to kind of take one stand on India when even in the U.S. there's been privacy issues. And all the same companies have had all kinds of issues here. So I don't think, you know, saying we won't go to India or India should do this. I think 
the Digital India strategy is very new. I think I welcome this conversation, and it will come. You know, the rights will come. It should but, come. But, uh, you know, I don't think we should be concerned about investing in India. I think Facebook has, I think, hundreds of millions of users. So does Twitter. Mr. Modi himself has hundreds of millions of fans. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's an issue. I think it'll come. And I don't think the entrepreneurs here that I know of in our community are hesitant to invest in India at all. In fact, I think venture capital investment and angel investment from Silicon Valley this year will double in India. Are there... Go, I'm sorry, I'm go sorry. ahead. Mary, uh, sure. um, I, I just, it, in last week's Economist, um, India was rated 142 out of 189 mm -hmm. countries as uh, the place to that was least friendly to business interests. Right. And I wonder how you would respond to that. And I, I accept that. I think India business. is a hard place to do business. But I think what the prime minister has done in conjunction with the World Bank, he's got, doing a state-to-state -state comparison. And I think that'll motivate all these different states to compete. And I think in a year or two, you'll see a dramatic improvement in the ease of doing business. I'm not condoning any of this. All I'm saying is we are impatient, but we're also excited. I want to put it in that framing as opposed to, you sure. know, just being impatient. Can well, I, well, yeah. oh. Can yes, I jump in here? Go ahead. I just want to say in response to the, the, the concerns about privacy in the U.S. and many other places, I agree with you. But as much as, as people here are, are, are discussing uh, uh, the NSA's role, privacy, and so on. We should also welcome the discussion in India. And we have been quite surprised by the vehement uh, sort of criticism of our letter as if mm -hmm. having the dis discussion itself is a problem. For us, that indicates that what we point out that this government and this particular political party and movement in power now has a problem with accepting criticism, with accepting playing by normal democratic rules. It, it, for us, it confirms mm -hmm. that, that that is a worry. And, and I'm very happy we actually wrote that letter because it has generated uh, the beginning of a debate sure, that I hope will carry on for a long time. Yes, yeah, generated a lot of conversation. Wanted to uh, also ask you about something else. Um, you know, according to a Stanford study, uh, Indian Americans have founded more technology companies mm -hmm. in this country than any other immigrant group. Mm -hmm. um, and Modi has made it clear that he wants to encourage these entrepreneurs to come back to India and help India. Uh, what are some of the factors that entrepreneurs are weighing before they come back? Because as Sunita pointed out, there's still a thorny tax code. Um, the infrastructure is underdeveloped. Um, and the Internet service yeah. is patchy. Yeah. So I think a couple of things. I think there are certain tax rules he has to change, which is quickly starting a company and quickly being able to close the company. So those are things that are being worked on, but they need to do that. On the other hand, though, starting a tech company in India, you don't need as many permits and regulations as starting a manufacturing company. So I think there's still a, a thriving ecosystem in India. I host an event in India, and last year we had a 1,000 startups. And compared to five years ago, there were only a couple of hundred. So I think the community is growing and is, is quite strong. And I think, you know, from that point of view, I think we're okay. We just need to change rules. I, I wanted to add um, a comment to that. I've seen increasingly that um, companies here, tech companies here, are interested in the bottom of the pyramid, addressing mm -hmm. the market that's at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, I, last week, I did a story about um, Thrive Solar Energy, which is uh, selling goose lamps to uh, Indian students so that they can study at night, because there's not a consistent source of uh, energy to about 400 million people mm -hmm. in India. So providing these students with these lamps significantly increases their capacity to learn. Um, there is uh, another fellow out here who has developed a small implement to put under a cook stove so that the efficiency of heat is concentrated. So I'm excited that the bottom of the pyramid is being addressed by Bay Area entrepreneurs. And you looks like you wanted to say something. No, Professor I just wanted Hansen. to add to that that I think that a lot of the excitement about the Digital India uh, project uh, in terms of generating jobs, in terms of uh, 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 generating connectivity, uh, could actually reach a much wider uh, uh, part of the Indian population because that is a problem in the Indian economic miracle, as it were. It has not been generating jobs. It has not touched millions and millions of people's lives at all. It's been very good for about 5 to 10, 15, maybe 20 percent of the population, but the rest of them uh, have not actually benefited in, in any major way. So I welcome a lot of these initiatives. I do think that most of the fundamentals still have to be addressed in terms of infrastructure, in terms of basic education and so on and so forth. And I see, I don't really see Modi moving on that. He moves on some of these uh, high-tech uh, sectors and, 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 and that's good. 
but that's only a very small part of the overall picture. Well, he's the first to visit in uh, more than 30 years here in the Bay Area, so certainly generating a lot of talk, sure. a lot of excitement, mm -hmm. and a lot of conversation, and a lot of healthy debate, we hope. Exactly. Yes. Thank you all for being here. Americans eat nearly 5 billion pounds of fish a year. The vast majority of that fish is imported. Now one company wants to build the largest fish farm in America off the coast of San Diego. The proposed fishery would be about the size of Central Park. It could produce up to 11 million pounds of fish per year. But environmentalists are trying to block the project. Claire Trakeser of member station KPBS reports. Don Kent is peering into a water tank about the size of a backyard swimming pool. He's waiting for his fish. There's some big guys in there. Here they come. A school of 10 yellowtail swim by, each about four feet long. That's a big fish right there. Kent heads the Hub Sea World Research Institute. He's leading us through the lab where his scientists are breeding fish. Hub Sea World is partnering with a private investment firm to create the Rose Canyon Fisheries Aquaculture Project. There are already fish farms in the United States, but this one will be near San Diego's popular beaches and will be the largest yet. At its largest, the proposed farm would be 48 cages divided into two grids. The grids will cover about one-fifth of a square mile, the same size as the parking lot around Qualcomm Stadium. Anchor lines will run from the cages to the bottom of the ocean. Those lines extend out, so the whole project will cover about 1.3 square miles. The cages could have poles that extend 16 feet above the water, but Kent says we won't see them from the shore. He has computer modeling that shows the cages won't look like this, but like this because they'll be below the horizon. To test that out, I did some trigonometry. My calculations showed if you're lying on the ground at the ocean's edge, you'd see the top third of a 16-foot pole. If you're standing up, you can see more. Environmental group San Diego Coastkeeper is concerned about the scale of the project. On a cool morning a few weeks ago, I boarded a small boat with Matt O'Malley. We set out from Shelter Island. After 45 minutes riding through some very choppy waters, we rounded Point Loma and stopped at a spot four miles off Ocean Beach. You come out to a place like this, you see how quiet it is, how pristine, how beautiful it is. This is where Rose Canyon Fisheries would go. O'Malley equates it to industrial farming. An animal feed lot, like a giant sort of, you know, constrained animal cow farm or pig farm and with no environmental regulations, no property right. Because it would go in federal waters, Rose Canyon Fisheries wouldn't buy or lease its space. It would have to get permits, but the project is the first of its kind, so there isn't an established federal agency to approve the project. If you're going to do it, and say San Diego is the proving ground for this. It's a private venture in public property, and we're going we're gonna to be the proving ground. We damn well better do it right. But Kent is betting the U.S. needs his project. That's because 91% of its seafood is imported, and countries like China that produce a lot of fish are now keeping more for themselves. So the price of seafood is going up higher and higher for people like us that have to import it. So the big advantage we have over those other supplies is from the fact that we can grow it locally. The U.S. already does produce some seafood and doesn't eat it. That's because Americans don't always like the fish native to our coasts, so we import from other countries, according to food journalist Paul Greenberg. His book American Catch describes a seafood swap. We tend to export stronger tasting things like mackerel, um, black cod, um, a lot of squid, and then we import sort of neutral tasting things like shrimp, um, also tilapia, and these are both very, very neutral tasting things that you can kind of deep fry and, and, and use in a, you know, sort of the American palate friendly, um, you know, sandwich. He says aquaculture can help correct this imbalance, but... Rather than trying to kind of start up, you know, new and complicated ventures. It'd be first off, let's try and eat the fish that we've already got. But aquaculture solves more global problems than Americans not liking fishy fish, according to Don Kent with Hub SeaWorld. There's 7 billion people on Earth now, and there's going to be 9 billion people before 
in your lifetime, very, very soon. How are we going to feed those extra nine, uh, 2 billion people? But O'Malley with Coast Keeper has several environmental concerns. 11 million pounds of fish will create a lot of fish poop. He says that waste could hurt the water below the farm and the ocean floor and could lead to algae blooms. Fish could also escape the cages and then breed with wild populations, hurting their genetic diversity. Diseases in the farm could also spread to wild populations. And he says marine mammals like sea lions will be attracted to all of those cage fish. They might get caught in the farm's cages or on its anchor lines. He says the farm could also change whale migrations and wild fish behavior. We're talking about putting a floating factory farm right off the coast in San Diego. Kent doesn't dispute its industrial farm label, but says it won't hurt the environment. He says they're using thick lines and plastic nets that won't entangle marine mammals. He's done modeling to show the farm is in deep enough water to dilute the fish poop. The cages are designed so the fish won't escape, and even if they did, they won't have diseases to spread. Kent also says it will take eight years to scale the farm up to its full size, and he'll be monitoring its environmental impacts along the way, just like you would with any farming project. But O'Malley with Coast Keeper points out the project's permits are for its full size. So once it's approved, it could begin churning out more fish before the impacts are fully known. This is our backyard, and this is a project that is massive and has a lot of potential impact. And we think if, as a community, if we're going to be embarking on a project like this, we want to make damn sure that environment is protected in the process. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. And that does it for us. For all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org. I'm Tui Vu. Thanks for watching.